But this was a bombshell political. I don't plan to drop out. I think it'll be a good thing for the party. We want to deal with our own problems within our own country, and we want peace in Vietnam. Those who got out of hand the other day. Chaos has just broken out downtown. Have now been talked with sufficiently uh, to guarantee that nothing will take place in terms of violence. I feel that we can still have a non-violent demonstration and that we will have a non-violent demonstration here in Memphis. The important thing is that we are not going to be stopped by mace, subjunctions, or any other methods the city plans to use, and I think they're making a grave mistake because this will bring much more support to the movement. There had been violence the last time he marched. So King comes back to Memphis to prove that he can lead a peaceful demonstration. We feel that this is something we have to do. The nation needs it. The movement needs it. Above all, the poor people of our country need a dramatic movement. There is a noticeable change in the mood in Memphis. Uh, people are concerned, and King gives a speech to galvanize his supporters. All we say to America is be true to what you said on paper. There's an injunction against marching but King is very, very defiant in that speech. He's saying they're still going to march. Somewhere I read of the freedom of assembly. Somewhere I read of the freedom of speech. Somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest for rights. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now, because I've been to the mountaintop. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know the night that we as a people will get to the promised land. The next day, we had breakfast that morning, all of us sit together. We were just talking about the next march. Toward the end of the day, Dr. King is out on the balcony, and he sees Jesse down there and James Bevel. All of a sudden, there was a bolt. We heard what sounded just like a firecracker, a loud, real, a real loud shot. And uh, I heard somebody holler, oh, Lord. And uh, then I turned around and went back to where he was, and he had fallen backwards. Police put out a bulletin for a young white man who witnesses saw flee immediately after the shooting. Uh, God knows this is the most tragic thing that has ever happened in, in my life. It was so sudden and so powerful. He couldn't have known what hit him. I remember Reverend having that to say, back up, back up, my dearest friend has been shot. So I got up and went to the phone and called Mrs. King. I said, Mrs. King, Dr. King, I think has been shot in the shoulder, I think. I couldn't say what I saw. His wife was notified in Atlanta tonight, told only that he had been shot in the shoulder to spare her uh, any further concern and alarm as she flew back to uh, Memphis. Uh, whether she has arrived there or not, we have not been advised. Do they know about Martin Luther King? That is the night that Robert Kennedy gave what is one of the more remarkable speeches any politician has ever given. Ladies and gentlemen, I have some very sad news for all of you, and I think for all of our fellow citizens and people who love peace all over the world. And that is that Martin Luther King was shot and was killed tonight in Memphis. Then the city was on fire. 
Washington, Chicago, Detroit, Boston, New York, these are just a few of the cities in which the Negro anguish expressed itself in violent destruction. For my parents' generation, King was the dream. And then he's gone. They were mourning the loss of the man, but also what he represented for them and what they hoped he would be able to achieve for their children. We've lost something, and we feel it deeply. We feel it. I don't think Americans should mourn Martin Luther King. I think they should mourn themselves. Show. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Last Monday was the 40th anniversary of the Academy Awards. The Academy Awards were moved because of Martin Luther King's assassination. This has been a fateful week in the history of our nation. We join with men of goodwill everywhere in paying our profound respects to the memory of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. It was his work that brought about the increasing awareness of all men that we must unite in compassion in order to survive. The Best Picture nominees that year were genuinely controversial and influential. Movies like Bonnie and Clyde, The Graduate, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, and In the Heat of the Night, both trying to address racism and race relations. Virgil, that's a funny name for a nigger boy that comes from Philadelphia. What do they call you up there? They call me Mr. Tibbs. In the Heat of the Night, Sidney Poitier was playing a black man who was strong, who was smart, who was decisive. The movie takes place in the Deep South. Let me understand this. You two came here to question me? We were just trying to clarify some of the evidence. Was Mr. Colbert ever in this greenhouse, say, last night about midnight? This is 1968. You don't have black men hitting white men in movies and getting away with it and living to tell the tale anyway. And he does. There was a time when I could have had you shot. Sidney Poitier completely holds his own, not just as an actor, but as the character, Virgil Tibbs. At its core, it's a murder mystery, but it's also about the way America is starting to change. The winner is, in the heat of the night, Walter Mitch. In South Vietnam today, about 20,000 Allied troops are pushing through on the ground to Khe Sanh, the outpost held by 5,000 Marines and now accessible only by air. All of this is bound for Khe Sanh. Tons of ammunition and supplies to be parachuted into the Marines tomorrow. 
Have you been here two and a half months that the uh, heavy shelling's been going on? I got here, I arrived at Case on the 19th of January, and we got hit the 21st, so it's been a long two and a half months. President Johnson was absolutely determined to pull the Marine base at all costs. More than 200 Marines have died here, 800 seriously wounded. There was never a large clashing of forces they hadn't expected, but the Marines were subjected to just a brutal onslaught. In the spring of 68, you get the most violent period of the entire war. The United States ramps up the use of military force, ramps up airstrikes. About 500 Americans a week are being killed. And of course, the backdrop for all this is the draft. No one knows when peace will come. And so for all the young men facing the draft, it is not an easy time to be a young man in America. I feel that every citizen, every male citizen, has an obligation to his country. I don't see the serving in the armed forces as meaningful in any way. No, no, we won't go! The draft has really mobilized young people. How many different ways can you say, hell no, we won't go? My name is Chris Brown from Jersey. Michael Dover, New York. Gerald Hutchins, New York City. So far, since the draft resistance movement began last year, between two and 3,000 young men have burned their draft cards or returned them to the federal government. Another four to 6,000 have fled to Canada to avoid the draft. It is just another example of American youth saying to adults, your values are not my values. The mantra of that generation is that you don't have to believe anything that your parents told you because look what they got us into in Vietnam. You had a generation that was willing to question authority. We had a feeling of us against them, you know, us against the government. Now I'll do a song that I wrote it <clears throat> against the American military. A song called I Ain't Marching Anymore. Phil Oakes had a song that said, always the old who lead us into war, it's always the young who fall. It's always the old to lead us to the wars. It's always the young to fall. We were aware of all that, you know, why would they send us somewhere and make us kill somebody? We're not gonna do that. So we sang anti-war songs. St. Peter said from Vietnam, I can tell. I know you'll go to heaven, son. You served your time in hell. We are messing ourselves up shows in many ways. It shows in the racial hatred in this country. It shows in the fact that at this very moment, 500,000 of our friends and our brothers are killing and dying in a jungle 10,000 miles away. And it shows in those cards we all carry in our pockets. Well, I'm finished. I'm a free man today. By 1968, colleges were kind of the frontline place where much of the protest of this period plays out. You saw the creation of SDS, Students for a Democratic Society, which organized activists college campus by college campus. In the spring of 1968, I found myself the chairman of the Columbia chapter of Students for Democratic Society. We are interested in Colombia. We would like to change it. We would like it to make it free of these racist elements. The central issue was Colombia expanding into black neighborhoods and destroying them to build more of Colombia. Also, Colombia was involved in secret research for war strategies. We felt that it was our duty to stop it. The war research was symbolic of the war itself. The expansion to Harlem, we called institutional racism. On April 23rd, there was a rally call, and all of these students showed up, and it turned out to be a huge crowd. We became kind of like a spontaneous mob, and we wound up occupying uh, the main classroom building. At Columbia University, students barricade themselves into university buildings. Their leader is a 20-year-old ex-Boy Scout. This is the politics of confrontation. 
And one way we keep going is by building this strike. The task was to keep topping yourself, to keep taking more and more risk. The student demands no more secret military research, no more construction on land in Harlem, and no punishment for occupying the building. People slept in sleeping bags, they slept on the floor, and we were constantly brought supplies and tossed them up to the windows. Within a couple of days, we were occupying five buildings. Nobody could go to classes. We hope very much that some settlement can be worked out which will not require us calling on police assistance. Grayson Kirk was the president of the university. He was a conservative guy who was under enormous pressure, and he wanted to end this thing, wanted to bring back order. OK, people, keep cool. There are cops for this crowd here. None of us will begin any violence. So if there's any violence, it will be because of the police. Gentlemen, show them the sidewalk or the building. President Grayson Kirk makes what he calls a painful decision and invites in the police. The police came in on some kind of rampage. Police brought out the students who'd been holding about five buildings for the past few days. What everyone feared took place. That's what the cops did. We stood in front of Lowe Library with our arms locked, faculty and students singing, We Shall Overcome, We Shall Not Be Moved. You look like you've got a little uh, blood on your face. What happened? Yeah, I think I was hit with a club, which started the bleeding. The policeman grabbed him by the neck and smashed his face into the chair. I could never again trust this administration, I could never again trust. They, if they didn't understand the kind of brutality that was going to be used on this campus, they should have. The young people were being attacked from everywhere. The United States ingested the violence of Vietnam. If there was death in Vietnam, there was going to be death in America. In all, 696 arrests were made, 109 injuries were reported. Most of the injuries occurred outside the buildings. There was this tide that was swelling across the country in which cities were burned to the ground. A voice was being raised by way of social consciousness and demonstration. And it was an angry voice. The revolution was televised, and it was televised live. Dissent is a necessary ingredient of change. But in a system of government that provides for peaceful change, there is no cause that justifies resort to violence. Let us recognize that the first civil right of every American is to be free from domestic violence. So I pledge to you, we shall have order in the United States. In 1968, Richard Nixon comes up with the phrase, the silent center. There are millions of people who do not demonstrate, who do not picket or protest loudly. This is the unspoken voice of America. This is the silent center. What that referred to was how the media was holding up these young student insurgents as the paragons of morality. And Richard Nixon understood, as no one else did, that that made the people who were working hard and playing by the rules behind their white picket fences feel silenced. The message was extremely effective. We were sailing serenely on a calm sea toward denomination. At this time in America's history, this watershed year 1968, at a time when America has never been in more trouble at home and abroad, there is nothing wrong with this country that new leadership cannot cure, and we promise that new leadership. This very large crowd of students has come to greet Senator McCarthy at South Bend, Indiana. This is the state in which he's going to have to meet with Senator Robert Kennedy head on. 
McCarthy has proven himself as the genuine voice of the anti-war movement. So Robert Kennedy has to demonstrate how he could be superior, not simply an alternative uh, to Eugene McCarthy. You may recall, I, at least I do, you may not, but in those early days, there was general regret that someone better than I had not offered himself. And I, uh... McCarthy and Bobby Kennedy were not pals. McCarthy had a rather biting wit. I had some of the same regrets, I suppose. I didn't know who the other man was, but I hoped that there was someone better. I couldn't name him right offhand at the time. But uh... My father didn't like McCarthy. He thought McCarthy was uh, um, effete. He couldn't picture McCarthy at a Cuban Missile Crisis. Eugene McCarthy was basically a one-issue candidate. He was a peace candidate, but Kennedy had a broader vision in terms of what's happening in the cities, what's happening around race and the issues of poverty. We want Kennedy! We want Kennedy! We cannot separate ourselves, no matter where we live, from the problems and the troubles and the difficulties that face the whole of the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, the Vice President and the next President of the United States, Hubert A. Humphrey. I shall seek the nomination of the Democratic Party. When Humphrey came in as a candidate, he was regarded as a Johnson surrogate. I will run on the record of the Johnson-Humphrey administrations, but I will not rest on it. And it was very clear to everybody that Johnson controlled the party. President Johnson will do what he can to help Humphrey win the nomination and to see that Senator Robert Kennedy does not get the nomination. Who would be nominated by the Democratic Party wasn't necessarily going to be determined by the primaries. It would be nominated by the people who controlled the levers of power, and that was Lyndon Johnson and his political machine. And it was Vice President Hubert Humphrey who would be the beneficiary. Nevertheless, if McCarthy Kennedy amassed enough delegates through the primary process, they might be able to put pressure on the Democratic machinery. Indiana's May 7th primary is critical to the Kennedy strategy of demonstrating to party leaders across the country that he's the one Democratic candidate who can win big. Indiana can decide who is going to be the nominee for the Democratic Party, and therefore very likely who's going to be the next president of the United States. McCarthy couldn't get any black vote. Bobby Kennedy managed to get black vote and also get a lot of the established Democrats, so his support looked very broad. Well, Senator Robert Kennedy has won the first primary test in his attempt to secure the Democratic nomination for the presidency. My father really focused on it. the people in this country. His appeal was to really the most disenfranchised classes. People who lived in Appalachia, blacks who lived in the Delta, people from Harlem, Watts, Oakland, and of course, farm workers. Very similar to Martin Luther King focusing on the poor and working people. In the aftermath of Dr. King's assassination, it's Coretta Scott King who has the legacy of her husband to draw upon to make the case that change was needed now. My husband always said that if anything happened to him to carry on his work for his people. Coretta was always an activist before Martin was an activist. And she continued to be outspoken in order to make the point that you can kill my husband, but this movement is going to go on. We have seen the power of nonviolence in the movement for civil rights. The campaign for the poor must go on. King's notion was to try to put pressure on Congress to do something about the issue of poverty. He was proposing to use modern terms, an Occupy movement on the National Mall. Not for a day or two, but to stay. I declare this to be the site of our new city, Resurrection City, USA. As Dr. King had dreamed, they built a shanty town to expose a nation's shame. They call it Resurrection City, and it sits on the lawn beside the reflecting pool at the Lincoln Memorial. We come in for one purpose, and we don't intend to leave here until we conquer what we came for. 
This is a CBS News special report. Peace talks in Paris. The very first step. The very first step did begin today in Paris. It was about as small as it could be. All of the problems attendant to a meeting of sovereign enemies were present. Who sits where? What language do you talk in? What do you agree to argue about? There were tremendous expectations on the American side about these talks. When the delegation first arrived, they just took hotel rooms because they thought, well, this is only going to be a few weeks, and then we'll get a negotiated settlement. The president is disappointed that the North Vietnamese today were unwilling to discuss anything of substance. And then after a while, they had to rent apartments because it was going <laughs> to drag on a lot longer than they thought. It is already Saturday in Vietnam, and the latest communist offensive is now in its sixth day. It may be that the communists are trying to remind the negotiators that the Viet Cong must have a seat at the conference table when the future of Vietnam is discussed. Well, it's a real horse race out in Oregon, and in that Democratic primary there that could mean so much to the presidential hopes of Senator Robert Kennedy and Senator Eugene McCarthy, it's too close, the CBS News estimate says, to call. Senator Kennedy did make clear over the weekend that the outcome in Oregon he felt was crucial to his hopes for the nomination. I can't lose. I mean, I just I can't afford to lose if I'm going to remain uh, a very viable candidate. Oregon was just as bad a state as you could imagine for Bobby. Very few minorities, very suburban, middle class, progressive, but kind of polite. And he never clicked there. Oregon was a McCarthy victory. We were certainly feeling euphoric that night. Every wagon train got as far as the Missouri River, but the real test began once you crossed the Missouri and started up the Oregon Trail. And now, of course, we're on to California. The shockwave is spreading slowly through this Kennedy election headquarters. The only word adequate to describe the result appears to be catastrophic. Kennedy had lost which you saw on display is something that doesn't get talked about nearly enough, which is Bobby's humor. Based on the return, I think an uh, entirely new look at my whole organization, my whole campaign is in order, which I've done. And I've decided to send my dog Freckles home. <laughs> I like Freckles. <laughs> I haven't really, he's coming with me. Yeah. The Oregon primary was the first time a Kennedy has ever lost an election. Bobby Kennedy knew he had to go into California, and he had to win. This campaign train is on a life-or-death mission. Robert Kennedy's fate as a presidential candidate now hangs on the outcome of the California primary. His crowds have been good this Memorial Day in the sun-drenched San Joaquin Valley. Bobby Kennedy, having lost Oregon, knew that he had to win California, and that would be his ticket to the convention. Kennedy is back among his people. And after the satisfied prosperity of Oregon, which failed to respond to Kennedy's approach, the senator is again turned on. He was a rock star. It gave him a kind of courage and power to keep going. Part of our job, everybody had to wrap your arms around his legs so he wouldn't get pulled from the car by his admirers. He campaigns so hard that his, his hand is swollen. He loses his voice. We're here in Los Angeles in California. You will have made it possible, and I will work with all of you. Give me your help. Give me your help. ABC News presents Race to the White House, complete coverage of the presidential election year 1968. Tonight, the California primary, coverage of today's presidential primary in the Golden State. An hour and a half after the polls have closed in California, the biggest primary of them all, a slate of delegates pledged to Senator Eugene McCarthy has established an early lead over a slate of delegates pledged to Senator Robert Kennedy. In South On the last day, the early returns were not good. Bobby kind of sat nervous like a little boy, worrying 
That doesn't mean anything. 49 to 38 count. <laughs> that doesn't mean anything. Los Angeles won't be counted until 10 o'clock. Why has he got 49% and I got 38%? Probably Hillsborough. But the returns got better, and Bobby was reassured that he at least had a fighting chance. With almost a quarter of the precincts having reported in now, Kennedy does lead with 44% of the votes. Whoever gets a plurality gets all of California's delegates. If Gene McCarthy loses, what happens to your political life? Well, if Gene McCarthy loses, I guess I'll have to vote for Kennedy. Final total will be Kennedy, 48%. Senator McCarthy, 41%. in what I consider to be the most poignant moment of the entire year after the winning result has come in and before Bobby Kennedy goes to declare victory, he turns to one of the oldest Kennedy retainers and says, I feel for the first time that I've made it on my own. I feel that I'm finally out of the shadow of my brother. Thank you very much. I want to express my uh, gratitude to uh, my dog, Freckles, who's been maligned. As Franklin Roosevelt said, I don't care what they say about me, but when they start to attack my dog. But it's, but, and I, it's not, I'm not doing this in the order of importance, but I also want to thank my uh, wife, Ethel. <laughs> It was tremendously exciting because for some time now, it had been building towards this moment, getting an anti-war person in the White House. And now, my God, like it's really going to happen. My thanks to all of you, and now it's on to Chicago, and let's win there. On to Chicago, and let's win there. I, I can just still hear him saying it. His aides want him to rush to a press conference. The press is waiting. They want him to give a statement. And so they take him by way of a shortcut through the kitchen. And that's where Sir Hans Sirhan was waiting for him. Senator Kennedy has been shot. Is that possible? Is that possible? It's good. Senator Kennedy, oh my God. Senator Kennedy has been shot. Ladies and gentlemen, we've kept the air on because we've heard an alarming report that Robert Kennedy was shot in that ballroom at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. A very loud noise like a clap of thunder was heard. A small... The great irony is for all the fear of um, crowds and tumult, it was trying to avoid crowds that took him through that kitchen. shot, he says to Ethel, how bad is it? And then he says to the ambulance attendant who comes in, please don't, please don't lift me. And those are his last words before he goes into a coma. There was very much the sentiment, how much is too much to take? Robert Kennedy is now undergoing a neurosurgical operation. He is said to be in very critical condition.
Senator Robert Francis Kennedy died at 1.44 a.m. today, June 6, 1968. He was uh, 42 years old. This was really the death of hope, a loss of belief in the entire system. My brother need not be idealized or enlarged in death beyond what he was in life. To be remembered simply as a good and decent man who saw wrong and tried to right it, saw suffering and tried to heal it, saw war and tried to stop it. Those of us who loved him and who take him to his rest today pray that what he was to us, what he wished for others, will someday come to pass for all the world. Well, I feel almost like hiding my face as an American that something like this could actually happen. I think we're having a little too much violence in this country. They go after the good men like John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, and Martin Luther King. Like Lincoln, long before Bobby Kennedy's body was taken in a train, it was a hot, humid, awful day, and the country mourned. They turned out all along those old Pennsylvania railroad tracks between New York and Washington as that funeral train slowly made its way down to Arlington Cemetery. I'm heartbroken. I think it's a terrible waste of a good man. It hurts me so bad to see him go. He stood for everybody, him and his brother. And what they tried to accomplish is just a shame how, how they just shot him down. More was being mourned than the shock and tragedy of another Kennedy assassination. What was being mourned was a vision for what 1968 was going to be. The following is a special report from CBS News in Washington. The Poor People's Rally. For the past six weeks, Resurrection City has hung on through unprecedented rainfall and a dwindling population. The Poor People's Campaign built Resurrection City to finally address racial and economic injustice in the United States, but ends up a tragic disappointment. It's one of the rainiest months in the nation's capital. They are living under deplorable conditions. Many of the poor who came see their high hopes trickle away in disillusionment. The campaign is at a virtual standstill. There appears to be a kind of insensitivity to our demands on the part of the congressman. They were completely taken aback by the response of legislators, many of whom were not moved by the spectacle. There's negotiations for them to leave peacefully. They say, no, they're going to continue. So the authorities come and swoop everybody out. people like myself and other poor people, they can't get no kind of help from nobody. Uh, look at Mr. Kennedy. Look at King. He was crying to only help the poor. He died. 
Kennedy was going to help the poor and they didn't give him a chance to kill Tim. But it's one thing they forgot. King had dream. They killed the dreamer, but they couldn't kill his dream. By late spring of 1968, a lot of Americans believed that things can't get any worse. But in many ways, we had some foreboding of what was coming. Convention will come to order. Did we come all this way for this? George Wallace's audience is growing both in size and in emotional outbursts. Political pigs, your days are numbered. There's real advantages in being an underdog. Troops arriving in Chicago in substantial numbers. Police all over the place. There's a really big fray going on in here. This is the mood of this convention on the floor. Thousands of young people are being beaten in the streets of Chicago. Oh! 